If you contact any of the artists featured in the podcast, sign up to their workshops or buy their products, don't forget to mention Creativity Found. The Disneyland of music, that's what it looked like to me. And I just had to be there. It was a heartbreaking choice because I'd made this new life with all these friends, you know, and I felt at home. But I remember feeling like such a failure and not wanting anyone to see me. It was my journey. And now I feel clearer, stronger. I have more of a purpose. Everything feels like it is as it should be. Everything feels right. Hi, I'm Claire, founder of Open Stage Arts Drama and Singing Classes for Adults. For this podcast, I chat with people who have found or refound their creativity as adults. We'll explore their childhood experiences of the arts, discuss how they came to the artistic practices they now love, and consider the barriers they may have experienced between the two. We'll also explore what it is that people value and gain from their newfound artistic pursuits and how their creative lives enrich their practical, necessary, everyday lives. For this episode, I'm speaking with music producer, songwriter and campaigner for the unheard in the music industry, Eve Horn. Eve has been on world tours with two girl bands, but has also struggled with depression, ill health and a loss of identity. Let's find out more. Hi, Eve. Hello. Hi. Now, you have had a roller coaster creative journey in, out, and happily back in again. Tell me what you do now. Okay, so now I run Peak Music UK. So I'm the founder of Peak Music UK. And I am also the founder of the We Are the Unheard campaign, which is a campaign for the equality of women in the music industry. I'm also a singer, songwriter and producer and a mum of a two and a half year old. Amazing. Okay, let's start with your family life as a child. Were music and the arts generally a part of that? And as a youngster, did you want music to be in your future? So, yes, very much so. So my nan was Irish and my granddad was Scottish. So we always had Celtic music in the house if we'd go up to my nan and granddad's, you know, it would always be a mixture between Celtic or or Frank Sinatra and things like that. We grew up on it. And then my mum um, loved reggae and lovers rock. So every Sunday we would, her, myself and my sister would get all the records out and sing and dance, you know, and, and that was just amazing. And I remember realizing that music was affecting me physically so when I heard songs that I liked it would affect my stomach and give me butterflies and I'd just get this overwhelming feeling that I couldn't explain but you know it's just all-encompassing you know and I loved it and that was from a very young age so yeah I always wanted I think from as young as six or seven I envisaged being on the stage and you know I remember one of the things that I loved doing first thing every morning was getting my VHS tape, putting it in and recording MTV or, you know, music television when it first came out and just recording all of my favourite stuff. And it was the same with my tape player. So <laughs> when the radio, uh, I'd, I'd hear the radio and, and you know, the, the DJ would talk over the song and they would dip it and I, I'd be like, oh, you'd have to wait for it to come round all again and try and find your song and you'd be ready with the record button. And then, God forbid, your tape chewed up and you'd have to get the, the scissors out and the pencil one round. <laughs> Screwdriver, get your knife out, un- unscrew it, a little bit of sellotape. Yeah, those are the good old days, right? Wow, I never went that far. I, I could use a pencil to wind the tape back in again, not stick it at an editing on oh, the no. actual set. Yes, I would <laughs> unscrew it, lay everything out, yep, yeah, get the tape, and then, then you'd, like, cut. Try and save as much as you can, cut the ends off, get a little bit of sellotape, cut it so it was equal and it didn't affect the the reel. Yeah, stick it both sides, place it back in nicely, you know, all back together. Lovely. You might have wow. a little gap in the song, but you're this happy is, with that. This is <laughs> going to make so much sense and become so relevant later on in this chat. 
<laughs> so you went to the Brit School in its early days. How did that come about and what was the experience like? From those early days, I just continued to just love singing and it was something that I realised was within me. And at the time, I was going to a Catholic school because we're, we're a Catholic family. And the Brit School opened in 1991 and I'd... A friend of mine had a prospectus and told me about it and I just got into my first year of secondary school and I was like oh my god I need to go to this place you know it just looked like the Garden of Eden in my mind Do you know what I mean like all right that's a bit drastic but let me liken it to Disneyland the Disneyland of music that's what it looked like to me and I just had to be there so I asked my mum and obviously there was a bit of, you know, it's not a Catholic school. And then my mum asked my grandparents and, you know, they were like, they agreed. You know, I was great academically, but I got very bored and I would just start messing about because I didn't learn the same way other people learn. Obviously, I realise that now, but then you don't. So I went to the Brit school when I was 13 and it just first opened and I was like, oh, amazing. But then I realised there was a different side of it, which was everyone is like me now. We're all, do you know what I mean? So you go from being the one who is the odd one out because you're a bit different and you want different things to being in a space where everyone wants the same thing. And then there's this whole competition element that I just wasn't ready for and I, I don't like any, I'm just not that type of person. So that affected me. But what an amazing experience the Brits was for me. We had a gospel choir, I did dance, I did theatre, I did art, I learnt drums, I was learning like computers for the first time as well. Uh, it was just brilliant. Yeah, it sounds great fun. It sounds like something I would have loved to have done yeah. myself. Yeah. Um, partly because of that, at a young age, you had success and a lifestyle that perhaps most people don't experience. Uh, tell me about those times, you know, what happened after school. Yeah, so I had to leave the Brits a year early because you can you can almost go into, it's like you start at 13, I think, and then you can go up to 18. Uh, so you can go on to do A-levels and stuff. So I did. I started my first year and did A-level A -level art, um, Lichtenstein, I think I, I chose. Mm -hmm brilliant love him um and then yeah a friend of mine who I had told about the school had come and got in and they had a girl group and we had our girl group and we'd done performances at Fairfield Halls and things like that and um they were looking to get signed and they'd been recording in the studio and doing an album and then one of the girls had left one of the girls in the group had been my friend prior to the Brits so she asked me to join. And so, yeah, we, we went and recorded an album in Metropolis Studios and all these other amazing studios back in the day and uh, then got signed to Polydor. I was 18 years old and I was in this massive record company office signing a contract with a glass of champagne. Uh, very surreal. But... Yeah, it was just, it's what I'd always envisaged. And then what did that entail once you've signed <laughs> the deal? What did you then have to do? So then we went on many tours. So we toured with Backstreet Boys. Uh, we toured with Boys Own, Peter Andre. Uh, we did Radio One Roadshow, which was all up and down the UK. We performed at Wembley, obviously, with, with the big groups. We were lucky enough to do like sing Backstreet Boys backings on stage every time they're on stage because you get to know them, you know, you, you, you're you touring with them and you're performing every night together uh, and eating together backstage and stuff. So we, we really had fun and, and they were like, yeah, you can do our vocals while we're on stage. So we do harmonies and stuff in the background. And it was great. Ooh. You know, we, we it was the best experience. It had its bad moments. But all in all, it was it was something that was just amazing to experience, and I'm super grateful that I did. You said it had its its bad moments. Yeah, are you um, open to sharing some of the downsides yeah. of it? Yeah. So the downsides of it were 
exhaustion, rivalry. Um, my first girl group, because after I signed to Polydor, I joined another girl group and we were signed to EMI in Denmark. But, like, you know, in the first girl group, there was bullying, massive, massive bullying. And it it took me years to recover. I used to have nightmares. Um, and I remember my mum saying, just leave, just leave. You know, it's not helping you that it's not healthy. And, and I, I knew even at that young age that my foot was in the door. And if I left, I wouldn't be able to get back in. So I was like, I have to wait for a, the right moment hoping that it would change or whatever but I knew I just I couldn't leave but yeah and, and it's exhausting you know you're flying constantly you you as soon as you get off the plane you you've got people that want to interview you in the airport you get in a car you get taken to a hotel there's fans outside there's record company people that you have to meet so you have to sign autographs put your stuff down then you have to go for dinner with the record label people in that country then you might have to go and do a sound check for the shows that you're doing. Then you would go and perform. And if you're doing a promo tour, you might have clubs that you need to go and promote at. So then you don't finish there till like one, two in the morning. And then you're up at four or five to do early morning TV or radio. So promo tours are gruesome, absolutely exhausting. Um, but, you know, it's... A double-edged sword as gruesome as they are as they are equally as amazing and mesmerizing and fantastic and an experience that you can't really explain to someone unless they've been through it yeah you mentioned the second group and uh being in Denmark yes tell me why the change and how was the second band and maybe how was it different from the first so the change came because our management at the time managed other acts and there was an act, a solo act, who hadn't had the experience we had yet of performing in big arenas and she was just about to, to do this um, by going on a tour with loads of other acts. We weren't doing much at the time. We'd done our album. I think we released a single, but our a and guys had changed and the new A&R was struggling to know what to do with us. So we were kind of like on a lull at the time, not really doing much. Uh, so I was like, oh, I'm happy to go on tour with her and show her the ropes. So I ended up going on tour with on a UK tour with her. And we were at a sound check uh, on the first night and she was on stage. And I was like just saying, oh, you know, this is how you kind of work the stage uh, in arenas. You know, you have to kind of engage both sides and then the middle. And sometimes you have to hold back a little bit you know, so that people can hear the performance, just standard tips. So someone had come out as I was, you know, giving her these things. Um, I didn't realise at the time. So we watched the show. It's brilliant. And, oh, I forgot to mention. So let me scroll back a little bit. While I'm in this other girl group, I'm, you know, the rule is girl groups hate girl groups. At the time, we were around Eternal and people like that. And it was just a thing. Don't know why they were great women, but you, that was just a thing you did. Oh, don't like them, don't like them. You know, so, <laughs> but I'm in my front room looking at the TV, watching my music videos as always, and this group comes on. And I was like, oh, I really like them, you know, because I love my 90s R&B. And they reminded me of that. And I got the butterfly thing in my stomach, love them. And I was like, I really did not know who they were. Anyway, fast forward, I'm watching the show this girl group comes on stage and it's them. And I was like, the penny dropped. I was like, oh my God, that's those, you know, I was like, oh, amazing. So I was almost like in awe as well. So we go backstage and I'm like, I need to tell them how good that show was because it was brilliant. They'd used amazing samples from wicked hip hop songs and stuff. And I was like, oh yes. So we went backstage just to congratulate them. And one of the girls had come out and thought, when we were doing the the, um, the sound check and and thought that I was her manager, so I was like, no, 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 I'm just a friend, and, uh, and so we just became friends. We from then on, every night we sang together. You know, we bigged each other up in interviews throughout the tour, and we just became really good friends. Then one night they come to me saying that one of the girls in their group wants to leave, and they want me to join. Ooh. And I, I was like, I'm in this group, and I, I was, I'm fiercely loyal. 
as unhappy as I was, I'm still fiercely loyal. And so I basically said to my management, long story short, I've been asked by this girl group to join them, but don't tell the girls because I haven't made my mind up yet. I just wanted you to know. Okay, so that was that. Fast forward, we go on another tour with this artist, my old girl group, and they're being really nice, overly nice. For the first time in four years, like, like, and I'm like, what's going on? Why are they being so nice to me? Like, I couldn't understand it. Anyway, we get back to the UK and I'm called to a meeting with their mums and it turns out my managers had told them. And then I got basically bullied into, you know, you can't leave, blah, blah, blah. This is the mums as well. So not only had I had to deal with all of the crap that I was getting given because the last member left and I was getting all the stuff from that, I then was getting put in this situation. And it was that moment I thought, if you have to be nice to me just because you realise someone else wants me, that's just, that's wrong. And it was then that I kind of had the light bulb moment that I'm going. This was my moment that I could change my situation. Yeah. I spoke to my lawyers. My lawyers had said that my managers were in breach of contract. And I just, I didn't want anything. I just wanted to leave because he was telling me all this other stuff I could do. And I was just like, I just want to go. So the the Monday I had spoke to my lawyers, the Saturday I was on a plane flying to Denmark with a champagne breakfast, having absolutely no clue what I was doing at the age of 21. Um, And lo and behold, I got in, I joined the group and it was... It was amazing. That was a completely different style of music, but we were lucky enough to have a Christmas single that went to number one and is still the most played Christmas song in Denmark nearly 20 <laughs> years later. Yeah. In front of, yeah, in front of... Um, uh, what's, what's George Michael's song, Last Christmas? Last Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yay. <laughs> 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 Amazing. So they were obviously happier times in yeah, this they... in this second band, uh, but it didn't last forever. Why no. did that come to an end? So from from the beginning, um, you know, it was obvious that one of the the girls in the group wanted to go solo, and it wasn't a secret. We we had gone through some managers and had all agreed that we we'll. we'll, we'll check out these managers and if we're not happy we'll just call it quits so that happened we weren't happy we called it quits I had the horrible choice of do I stay in Denmark or do I move back to the UK it was a heartbreaking choice because I'd made this new life with all these friends you know and I felt at home and then I had to come back to the UK where no one really knew what I was doing the last few years because we were touring in Asia and everything and also because I'd got a little bit more fame, you know, people's opinions of me had changed and just what happens with the territory. So in the end, though, I did come back to the UK because I had my flat and if I stayed, I would have lost it. Um, so there was a lot of other factors. My nan and granddad, I wanted to make sure I came home because they were getting older. And it was then that I flew back to the UK and got smacked bang in the face with depression hit me so I did not know what was happening had no idea and yeah it was horrible was that instantly on coming back to the UK because obviously you said you had family to come back to but presumably not a lifestyle to come back to or a job to come back to was that all a part of it yeah yeah, so what had happened is my identity as I knew it was being an artist, being on stage, performing, touring. I'd gone straight from school to doing that. You know, it was my dream that I was living and it had stopped. I'd gone from being on GMTV to having to pay to get on a bus. And I know that sounds so bad, but I remember feeling like such a failure and not wanting anyone to see me. And I spiralled and spiralled. And it was about the year 2000. And depression wasn't really a thing then. You know, it wasn't spoke about. It wasn't known as much as it is now. So 
I would get the normal comments like, you know, think of other people that are worse off. The frustration in me, I'd be like, you're making me worse. I didn't know who I was and I didn't know what was happening to me either. So I did my best. I, I was like, OK, uh, I decorated my flat the same colours as in Denmark. I went to the gym. I went to the doctors who put me on antidepressants and I went for about three different ones because I was like, I'm going to the gym and I'm yawning like 20 times in a minute. Um, I'm like, feel like I'm falling asleep. I enrolled for for courses like music because I was like, okay, I realized I don't like the fame side of the industry because anytime I was uh, like not in the mood and I'd be like, why are they staring at us forgetting I'd just been on morning television and people were not recognizing me and wanted my autograph. Uh, and I'm not, I'm just like, I'm, I'm not in the mood. And so that was really hard for me to put the face on and smile and pretend and take the photo. And I didn't like it, but I love performing and stuff like that. So I came home and I, I enrolled in, at university to be a sound engineer, all whilst having depression and stuff and still having a loss of identity and trying to grapple at anything I could to hold on to <laughs> to who I was. Yeah. Did going to university and reconnecting with music that you love, but in a slightly different way, did that help with how you were feeling? So it did. It, it really kind of helped me to, um, I guess, get my teeth into something else and distract me slightly from what was going on. Uh, but what had happened is I ended up having like a love-hate relationship. I almost couldn't talk about what I had just gone through. One, because it was painful because I wasn't doing it anymore. And two, because I didn't want to seem like a show-off, you know, and blow my own trumpet. So, but by going to uni and learning the other side, I, I felt underneath that I was strengthening myself and broadening my tool pool, which is something that I like to say in my lessons now when I teach people, because it's so important, because there are many facets to the music industry. And so by doing this, I knew later on down the line, whatever happened, these are tools that I would have for life. And it so happened at university, there was only six women in the whole year, and I was one of them. And I was the only one of colour of the students. And it was there that I did my dissertation on the lack of female sound engineers in the music industry. And that's kind of when the pin dropped or the penny dropped or whatever about the different sides of the music industry, because I'd obviously only seen it from an artist side and was only ever interested in it from that. But this really opened my eyes to the other side. And then, so when I graduated from uni, myself and one of the other girls, we went to the Prince's Trust to get funding to build a studio in Woolwich in the Royal Arsenal, which is where I'm from. One, because I wanted to support underprivileged young kids and because there's nothing in my area, which is why I had to travel two and a half hours to the Brit School and back every day. Um, and the other one was to promote female producers. So we, we built our studio and with that in mind, and we ran that for five years. And we won, I don't know if you can see there, there's a National Business Award. Cool. There. Enterprise in London, and that is, no, that's an Enterprise in London Award, and that was a National Business Award uh, oh, for brilliant. the work we did. And behind that is my um, graduation picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I realised then that I want to start kind of raising awareness and supporting people and mentoring young people. And I really got a feel for for that because I realised that it just there's such a massive hole back then that, you know, no one was doing it, so... I put all my energy and focus onto that while still trying to struggle with with my own stuff. Yeah, and we know that you are doing a lot more of that now, but there was a bit of a period <laughs> in between <laughs> of um, something something completely different. <laughs> and there was, darling. <laughs> I love sharing my guests' stories with you, but podcasting isn't cheap. There are hosting fees and software costs. 
tech to buy and time to invest in planning and editing to make sure the guests sound great and listeners hear the best content. If you would like to financially support Creativity Found, please visit ko-fi.com slash creativity found podcast. It's not as funny as we're making it out to be. But um, so tell me about that in between time. Tell me about what happened to you and, and how you how you tried to direct your life at that time before you were then luckily able to come back to the wonderful music yeah. that you do now. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, it's been such a crazy journey. So we had the studio and unfortunately, uh, my business partner's mum passed away. And we had been running the the studio and the business for about five years, doing absolutely everything from our own website design to our funding applications to running 18-hour days, recording sessions to, you know, you name it, everything. And we were a bit exhausted. We worked with schools, with councils, and that, I think, just kind of did it for her and she didn't really want to do it anymore. Uh, And... What had happened is we used to always bring our computer to an Apple store to get it fixed if something was wrong, and they ended up having vacancies there. So we both applied for a part-time role, and long story short, we got them. I became uh, an expert at Apple, and she became a genius. And I was there for about I know for about five years, I think. I think it was about five years, and um, while this was happening. I'd had a hysterectomy uh, because I had severe endometriosis and my endometriosis had, after the hysterectomy, had spread to my bowel. So I was going in for an operation for what I thought was just to kind of take the rest off. But I went down for surgery at like half 11 and didn't get back onto the ward until about 9.30 at night. And I woke up with uh, a colostomy bag. Well, it was an ileostomy, um, so a stoma. And uh, so, again, massive knockback, massive, massive, massive. My identity, again, was gone. I lost my sense of humour. I lost everything that made me feel like a woman. I didn't feel sexy. I I felt even more lost. So I'm trying to deal with it already. I'm trying to deal with the depression. I'm trying to find myself. I just keep everything just feels like it's knocking me back. I'd been trying to hold on to music as much as I could. Even at Apple Store, you know, I was still around creative people. So that was one of the things in my choices. I was like, you know, what? if there's creative people there, I can still talk about it and be involved somehow. And it was when I was in hospital and stuff that another thing came up. It was the fire brigade or train driving. And the fire brigade I wanted to apply for because it was helping people. So I thought, but then I knew some firefighters and they're amazing people and they're fantastic at what they do, but I knew I would get bored and I'm not one of these people who can sit around waiting for, I guess, an emergency to happen. I'd done the physicals and passed and everything and I actually got in, uh, but because I'd had my operation, I knew I was too weak to do the physical, so that was out of the window. And then I'd also applied for the train driving thing and I got it. And so I was like, if I can't do music and, you know, I can't do anything I love, I might as well do a job where I get as much money as I can for little physical energy, like because I was still ill. So I was a train driver for a minute and then about a year and then I went into shunting, uh, which is when you're in the depots and you do all the safety checks and stuff like that. Um, So that... That was an interesting one. Really was not my environment. Found it really hard to fit in. Felt really trapped. Um, Just just not morally. Everything about it was just not me. I remember my first day phoning my mum in training going, I don't know, what have I done? Um, But the money was great. And I would recommend any young person who wants to... I guess, do well in their life these days to apply for train driving. It's The job is fantastic. I loved being a shunter. It was brilliant. I loved the job. If it's an environment you can handle, I would recommend go and do it. Keep your existing outgoings as they are. Don't buy a new car. Don't buy a new house. Save. 
save, save, save. And then you can buy with cash because that nowadays is the only way young people, I think, can get on. And it's, it is a lifelong career for some people. So I would recommend young people giving it a go now, 100%. Yeah. Why am I promote, look at me promoting <laughs> train driver. I'm like, yes, be a train driver. <laughs> but you know, it's, it wasn't all gloom and gloom, and I have to, I have to show both sides of it. And this is just me and my personal side, because of who I am, that it didn't work for me. You know, so. exactly. Yeah. So that that wasn't fulfilling for you. No. So. What led you to, or perhaps allowed you to, break away from that unfulfilling role or lifestyle Mm -hmm. and get back to music? I'd got to the point in the job where I had become a trainer and an assessor because, again, I went back to that mentor trainer role to give back to people, to give me some purpose. You know, more, I needed more, but I wasn't getting, so I did that. And, um, it just got to the point where I just I was just so frustrated by loads of different things that I won't I won't go into. And from years of being unhappy and my partner and my mum saying, Leave, just leave. And I'm like, Yeah, but where am I gonna get another job that pays this well? And then I like, don't like forget the money, just leave. If you're not happy, leave. And they were making it sound so simple and I was I just felt stuck. And so I'd, I'd gone to get some counselling because um, I'd gone off sick with stress and stuff. And I requested this person who did CBT because I'd had CBT before and it really, really helped. So I went to see him and it was because of him that I got all of these light bulb moments. You know, we were thinking about having our daughter. And he was like, what would you say to your daughter? And, and I was like, thing of course I'd say this of course I'd say that of course I'd and I was like all right okay (laughs) and another thing he said was that I'd been constantly trying to prove myself for years and years due to stuff that had happened in my past or maybe because my dad wasn't around or being gay or you know whatever the circumstances were and he said one thing to me and was like you don't have to be that person anymore you've done it so many times and I was like yes you're right and I literally I was like I could see clearly and and that was the moment that I was like I'm going in I've got to do this and I I left and I dived head first and I made two promises to myself one was I'm gonna be open to absolutely everything that comes my way I had no idea what I was doing again didn't know about the music industry anymore. It moved so far. And and the other thing was to have fun. Because I'd spent so long comparing myself to the old me and the old things that I'd achieved that whenever I sat down to make a track or write a song, I thought I was rubbish. And I couldn't, I was stuck. I just couldn't move past it. And I realized that all this time I'd been blocking myself from moving on. But at the same time, I had to go through all of this to get to where I am now. It was my journey. And now I feel clearer, stronger. I have more of a purpose. Everything feels like it is as it should be. Everything feels right now. That's so positive. (laughs) Oh, that's just so happy and just just such the right outcome. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me then what everything is that you're doing now. So tell me about peak music, about songwriting, about retreats, about the Unheard campaign. So, um, yeah, I dived in. I started Peak Music UK and originally I started doing hands-on workshops for songwriters to give them the tools to get production knowledge to start doing production themselves even if they didn't want to do the whole thing I think I realized that they didn't understand the language that producers use so I wanted to let them know you know just giving them more confidence when they went into a studio environment to be able to express how they want their song to sound and know that the process the producer is using so they can you know be more in control so I started doing that and that went really well my first one was sold out and that was in 2020s So I think it was either February or March I did my first workshop, went brilliantly. 
I had also had my first songwriting retreat pretty much full up. I bought the T-shirt. I'd had everything ready. And then COVID hit. And so I had to cancel all of my workshops that I'd planned and obviously my retreat. And then actually like pivot and change what my business was about because I just set it up and things that I'd seen could be successful because they were getting sold and were working. So that happened. And then I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? So uh, I started getting some business advice and things like that. And through doing that, I realized um, and talking to friends, actually, because they were like, what are you wanting to do in your business? And I'm like, well, you know, these are my passions. And they're like, well, but are people seeing that? And I was like, well, no, not really. They're just seeing me doing like workshops and stuff. And so it really made me think about the things that I was passionate about and that I always have been throughout my whole life, which is promoting women, supporting young p people, LGBTQIA+, and women of colour. That's when I launched the campaign to promote equality for women in the music industry. Because 20 years ago, when I was doing my dissertation, uh, fast forward to now, hardly anything's changed. Female producers have just creeped up to 3% uh, in 2020. There are other stats that are equally abysmal, but I'm really like bad with my stats, so I always get them wrong. But it's around, it's around like 70%, 17% for songwriters out of the top 100 are women. Um, DJs are doing better, but still, again, they're, they're you know, at the lower end. Uh, and we're just talking women. We're not talking colours. We're not talking mums either. I was like, what can I do? What can I do as me to make a change? And then so I launched the campaign. And I can say now that I've sold enough T-shirts to start doing my first workshop for for young women in production and songwriting. Yay! Um, yay. So I'm going to hopefully be doing that this year, which is great. And I've done a lot of talks with, you know, universities and songwriting camps for women and non-binary people. And, and it's for me, it's about, you know, being present and uh, hoping to launch my, my podcast soon called We Are The Unheard which is going to give another platform to people. And we're going to talk about everything. So it's not just going to be women in music. I want to touch on things like depression because I felt very unheard when I had depression. I want to touch on things like religion. And I want to touch on things like menopause because I'm going through my menopause now. Hysterectomies, bowel surgery, you know, mm. all of the things I've been through where I have felt unheard. And I know there are other people that feel the same. I want to offer them a platform and be their voice. So that's where I'm at now. And I'm also doing programs and workshops for women to give them confidence and help them realign with who they were when they were younger and refine their goals and dreams and passions. And I'm doing that through the tools of songwriting. That just sounds fabulous and very much in keeping with the creativity found ethos of continuing or to start exploring your creativity as adults 100%, 100% it's so important because society just literally dampens us out it kills us it kills our spirit it kills our drive it kills our passion we get bombarded with mundane everyday life our flame gets put out by other people's jealousy and their unhappiness. For me, I have to take responsibility that I allowed other people's unhappiness to stop me from shining. That was my fault. And if I can help other young people to make sure they don't go through that when they're young, you know, they realise that when a bully comes up to you and is mean, it's their problem hold the mirror back up to them and say, I feel sorry for you that you have to do this to me to make yourself feel better. Cool. Eve, how can people connect with you? So they can get to me through my website, which is www.peakmusic.uk. You can buy a T-shirt from there also to support the campaign and all of the proceeds from the T-shirt sales go back into uh, supporting women, young women in production and songwriting. 
You can also get me on all socials. I'm Eve Horn, Eve underscore Horn, any of those variables. Uh, we are underscore the unheard on Instagram and, you know, Peak Music UK on all of the other socials. So Insta, Twitter, all the other things. But you'll find me anywhere trying to talk about the campaign in one way or another. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eve. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Claire, for having me. It's been my honour. Creativity Found is an Open Stage Arts production. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, rate and review. If you would like to contribute to future episodes, visit ko-fi.com slash creativityfoundpodcast. If you contact any of the artists featured, sign up to their workshops or buy their products, don't forget to mention Creativity Found Podcast. On Instagram or Facebook, follow at Creativity Found Podcast, where you'll find photos of our contributors' artwork and be kept abreast of everything we're up to.